The next topic under the unit of government institutions is the legislative branch. So the United States legislative branch is referred to as Congress, and Congress is bicameral, has two chambers, the lower chamber, the House of Representatives, the upper chamber, the Senate. This, is, um, this PowerPoint, this video is going to be a very basic overview and introduction of the legislative branch. So let's look at the differences between the qualifications of the House of Representatives members and the qualifications of the Senate and the different responsibilities. So in the House of Representatives, um, you are have to be 25 years old. Uh, generally, when the framers were thinking about representatives, they were going to have less experience. This was going to be the chamber that was really driven by the will of the people. So they are considered the zeitgeist. They're going to do the more short-term policies, such as the taxing and spending policy or initiating impeachments. Again, the framers felt like if they were going to be the branch or the part of the government that was closest to the people, they would be the branch of government that would be responsible for spending the people's money. They have a two-year term, so they are constantly trying to please their constituency, and their constituency are the people who they represent. You will see um, after this past 2018 midterms in the 2nd District of Virginia, Scott Taylor only got to serve his one term because he wasn't really able to connect with the people of the 2nd District of Virginia. So then they elected Elaine Loria, a Democrat. So that's the idea behind the House of Representatives. And if you look back at the Federalist Papers and what the Founding Fathers had hoped for for the House, they had hoped that the House of Representatives, that a lot of people would want to run and serve in the House of Representatives, um, and that the House of Representatives would have higher turnover. But that's really not the case. This is the current makeup of the House of Representatives as of November in 2018, and this will change. There will be more Democrats in the House of Representatives in January. If you serve in the House, you serve a district, which is a portion of a state. Um, and remember going back to the discussion about single member districts. So each district is represented by one House of Representatives member, and that House of Representatives member wins the seat if they win a plurality of the vote. The Senate, they're supposed to be the more experienced folks, so they are going to be the long-term policymakers. Doing things like treaties, things that have longer lasting implications. They have six-year terms. They are staggered. So in this past 2018 midterm election, a third of the Senate was up for re-election. So a third of the Senate is up every two years. So in 2018, Tim Kaine was re-elected to, to represent Virginia. In 2020, Mark Warner will be running to keep his seat. You serve a state, and that means you have to please a more diverse population as opposed to a single district. Okay, the different powers that the different houses have, I'm going to go through this quickly because this is in your constitutional study guide from the summer, and I just want to break this down. Both of them have the power to coin money, the express power to maintain an army and navy. Both of the chambers, the House of Representatives and the Senate, can introduce legislation regulating commerce. Both can introduce legislation to build roads, establish courts. And it takes both of them to declare war, and of course both of them are responsible for writing laws. The House specifically has the power to impeach the President, break electoral college ties, and initiate or start all taxing and spending legislation. The Senate is responsible for ratifying treaties and approving the nominations of judges and cabinet department secretaries or other major um, Major, um, <laughs> sorry, my dog's doing something weird. Uh, major executive 
nominations. <laughs> Sorry. All right. The job of Congress, it's hard work. Um, a lot of people think, oh, well, they go, you know, your legislators go up to D.C. and they don't do anything. They just waste taxpayers' money. But it's actually not the truth. It is hard work. Even if legislation isn't getting passed, um, there's more that they do than just voting for legislation. They serve on several different committees that have different responsibilities beyond the responsibility of writing laws. They're pulled in a lot of different directions. So when you go to Washington, you have to listen to interest groups. You listen to your constituents. And first and foremost, you listen to your party. So that's we know the environment in Congress is very partisan. Party politics is something that will really tear apart the ability of our Congress to write legislation. There are many perks to the job. Um, you get uh, you get a decent pay, as you see right here, even in recessions. You have immunity from being arrested. <laughs> so if you want to drive down the streets of D.C. going uh, 95 miles an hour to get to a vote in Congress, you really can't be pulled over. And you have the revolving door. So the revolving door is once you leave Congress, there's probably a job waiting for you in the private sector doing something related to what you did in Congress. So, and you have lots of power. Influence over Congress members. <clears throat> so to continue on that, Congress members are pulled in a lot of different directions. Right. Congress members are required to maintain a delicate balance. They have to protect the public good of an entire country, but they also have to look out for their constituents at home. So, for example, Bobby Scott, House of Representatives member in the 3rd District. He has to worry about voting on legislation that prevents like, coastal flooding. He wants to work on legislation that is going to increase military spending and make lives better for veterans because we are a heavy military area. But he has to also con consider what is good for the country. So for example, a couple of years back they were thinking about moving an aircraft carrier from Norfolk Naval Base to Mayport which is outside of Jacksonville, Florida. And Bobby Scott pushed for that aircraft carrier to stay here. Now that might not have been what's best for national security, but it was what was best for the third district. And that's the kind of decisions that your Congress members have to make or think about. Congress members are going to work as a trustee, a delegate, or a politico. So if you're a delegate, when you are voting on legislation, you are considering your constituents and the people that you represent on a pretty regular basis, you're going to go and check back with what the people want. You might hold a lot of town hall meetings. You might send out surveys to your constituents. Some things that if you're working as a delegate, what you are doing is you're bringing home pork barrel legislation. So thinking about bringing home the bacon. You are getting federal money, federal grants, to be pumped into your state or your district. Now though that money might not benefit the nation as a whole, but that money is going to benefit your people. And if you're a delegate and you're listening to your people and you have your finger on the pulse of what your constituents want, then you're not necessarily worried about is this like fourth crossing in Hampton Roads, like another tunnel in Hampton Roads and a federal grant for $86 billion, is that really going to benefit the people in Iowa? You don't care. You're worried about the people in Hampton Roads. You're worried about what your constituents are saying. Casework. As a delegate, you're worried about your constituents and you're going to help them navigate any of the red tape when they're dealing with the departments and different agencies of the federal government. Casework is when you do favors for your people. So if it was time for me to retire and I was applying for Social Security, what I might do is call Bobby Scott's office and say, hey, um, I need help 
applying for Social Security benefits, and a staffer, somebody who works for Bobby Scott, would be able to help me navigate the paperwork of applying for Social Security. You might ask Bobby Scott to do you a favor, or Tim Kaine or Mark Warner to do you a favor, if you're trying to get into a military school and you need a letter of recommendation from one of your Congress members. That's kind of the stuff that's casework. Personal convictions. Um, your beliefs and experience will guide your decisions. If you're a trustee, you might go to Washington and say, my people have elected me and now I don't need to necessarily go back to them and ask them what they want me to do. They've elected me and they trust that I'm going to do what's best for them and I'm going to make decisions based on my personal convictions and, or based on what I think is best for my people and I don't have to go back and talk to them constantly. That also means that you might be relying on interest groups to provide you information. So if you're working as a trustee, you might say, I don't need to go back to my constituents and ask them what they want. I can just get information from interest groups. I get highly technical and value, valuable information and they really know what is what about a piece of legislation, probably better than the people that I serve. Now the most important influence over Congress members is your political party. Most of the time, about 90% of the time when you're voting on a piece of legislation, you are going to be doing so because your political party has told you to. That is acting as a politico. So there's a couple of things that we could talk about. The first important term is log rolling. Log rolling is when you make decisions on a piece of legislation because your fellow congressmen have asked you to vote for a piece of their supported legislation. So for example, let's say I'm serving in Congress and so is Mr. Henson. Mr. Henson has introduced a bill, uh, an education bill, an education spending bill, and he needs to gather support for this bill. Sorry, that's my dog's collar. Uh, he needs to gather support for this bill. So he could come to me and say, hey, Jerome, do you want to support this piece of legislation? And then when you introduce your piece of legislation about preserving national forest in a couple of weeks, I'll vote for yours. So it's kind of an ex like a quid pro quo or tit for tat um, exchange of votes. Like I'll support yours, you support mine. And this is definitely something that you do to try to get legislation through. Hence the term log rolling. So when you're log rolling, you have two lumberjacks that are on a log and they're working together to unjam a log or, you know, to unjam the logs in a river when they've gotten blocked up. I'll show you some videos when I get back to work about log rolling. It kind of makes it a little bit clearer. All right. Whips and party unity score. So there is a leadership position in both the House and the Senate for both parties, the Republicans and the Democrats, called a party whip. The party whip is responsible for getting party members to vote together. So the Democratic whip whips the rest of the Democratic members of Congress into shape and make sure that they support what the Democrats would like to see as far as legislation. Um, or you can have a Republican whip. A Republican whip might work on making sure that all of the Republicans in the Senate support a judicial nominee of the president. So the whip, and you just think about like um, a, a person trying to whip cattle into line and make sure that all the cattle are moving together. Hi dog. Um, make sure all the cattle are moving together. That's what the party whip does in Congress. If the party whip is successful, then they're going to be a high party unity score. And a party unity score is just a measurement of how often Republicans and Democrats work together, or how often all of the Republicans vote together and how often all of the Democrats vote together. And then, of course, don't forget about the president. The president can use his bully pulpit to pressure mem uh, members of Congress to support his legislation. 